Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Today we're doing a turbo dose on head injuries. We're going to be looking at causes, how you assess these patients. We'll then have a look at different types of intracranial hemorrhage. Have a look at how we can manage these patients and briefly talk about concussion. Head injuries. There's two main causes of head injuries, which is a direct trauma to the head so caused by maybe an injury, a fall, a punch, or there's an indirect trauma from rapid acceleration or deceleration, so such as a road traffic accident. Your primary brain injury is the injury that occurs as a result of your initial trauma. And secondary is, um, injury is caused by the following edema and pressure buildup. There's nothing we can really do about that primary insult. We can't stop no. somebody being punched or having their, their skull fracture particularly, but it's, management is geared up towards preventing that secondary injury. When we're looking at these patients who have come in after a, after a head injury, we're obviously going to adopt a primary survey. And I think it's important at this stage to actually highlight that these are trauma patients. So a lot of the time, if you walk into the waiting room or whatever, uh, of emergency departments or GP surgeries, and we sort of get thrown by them not being presented in a way that would suggest major trauma. But it's important that we think of them as trauma patients. So a primary survey, including a full GCS, is very important. It's important that we consider investigating things for, for collapses, particularly for elderly patients who, who present with uh, what they would describe as a fall, but actually need to really hone down on the history. Actually, you know, Do they remember the act of falling? Are we sure this is a mechanical trip? Or is there a potential for a collapse if they had a bit of a laser vagal or, or an arrhythmia or something like that? So considering investigations that are collapsing, have a look at an ECG, do a lie standing blood pressure if we think it's appropriate. But one of the key decision-making tools that we use when we're seeing patients with head injuries is the other nice head injury guidelines. Now, I won't go through them in, in particularly deep, great detail, but essentially we're looking for some key risk factors that are going to indicate uh, a raised intracranial pressure, uh, those being a reduced DCS, a post-traumatic seizure, any focal neurological deficits, more than one episode of vomiting since the head injury. The other key risk factors that we're interested in are either a suspected open or depressed skull fracture, or any evidence that's just a base of skull fracture, those being a panda eyes, bilateral black eyes, otorrhea or, or rhinorrhea, so blood or uh, CSF fluid, which is sort of like a, a pale yellowy type fluid coming out of the yeah. all the ears, uh, indeed, or battle sign, which is bruising behind the, the master processes. Um, if you've got any evidence of those, then we're going to want a CT scan pretty quickly and nicer. That should be within one hour. Otherwise, one of the key things we need to get from my history is anticoagulant use. Now, if you're looking at the flow chart of the NICE guidelines, they talk about warfarin, and they don't talk about the other anticoagulants. If you read the full text of the NICE guidelines, if you're that dull, which I unfortunately am, uh, it talks he about... Is. He really is. <laughs> He's not joking. It talks about a clotting abnormality, which is a bit vaguer. So generally in practice, we consider the, the DOAC, so your riveroxone, your epixaban, to be equivalent to, to warfarin. We don't tend to consider antiplatelets as being equivalent to that. That comes with some caveats. There's differences in practice. Sometimes if you're on certainly dual antiplatelets, you might have a lower threshold for, for CTing that patient. And certain antiplatelets, such as clopidogrel, seems to have higher bleeding rates than, than aspirin alone. But otherwise, the rest of it is in the, in the NICE guidelines. We won't go through it here because it's a poor modality mm. to look at yeah. um, guidelines. But have a little look in your It's really time. clear. Yeah, it's really clear. And the algorithm's great. Yeah. And if you're on YouTube, we'll just stick a picture of it because it's really easy. So let's say, Emma, we've, we've gone through, we've seen our patient with a head injury, we've looked at the, the CT head NICE guidelines, and we've, we've done a scan, and oh no, there's some intracranial blood. What types of intracranial hemorrhage are we looking out for? Oh, Matty, great question. Thank that you. Be... It's like we pre-scripted it. <laughs> I would have thought. <laughs> There could be a few different kinds of bleeds. So the first one could be an extradural hematoma. Now, this is often due to a middle meningeal artery that's been torn under the temporal bone. Um, so it could be classically, you know, a bash to the side of the head from a cricket ball or a cricket bat if someone's really angry. Um, and typically in exams or in your an, textbooks. An angry cricket bat. <laughs> an angry cricket bat, yeah. <laughs> you find those all the time. Um, so this would give classically in your textbooks or exam questions, an initial lucid period. But actually, in real life, this is quite uncommon. Um, but typically, you know, we'd say lucid period before then deterioration. The next kind, number two, is your subdural hematoma. And this is due to a venous tear, typically, again, with a sudden acceleration-deceleration injury, perhaps, you know, in a car crash or something. This is more common in atrophied brains, so brains that are a bit shriveled, basically. And so elderly people, our colleagues, 
and also our anticoagulated patients. Chronic subdurals um, can present quite subtly with a gradually unsetting confusion um, or drowsiness. Number three, subarachnoid hemorrhages. So you might see these in an exam where they say about the worst pain they've ever had, but I suppose when we're talking about head injuries, these ones are most common in a very severe head injury and they can also cause meningeal signs so things like neck stiffness. And then number four is your intraparenchymal. Parenchymal? Parenchymal? Uh, the dealer's choice, I think. Parenchymal or parenchyme? Intraparenchymal. I'm, I'm a parenchyme now, I don't know. But, yeah. we'll, we'll go with that. The unfortunate thing about these is there's fewer neurosurgical interventions that are available and the prognosis is worse. So moving on to talk about management then, and it's it, the key bit of physiology we need to understand before we talk about that is that the cerebral perfusion pressure equals the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. The point of that equation, but what that basically means is that if you raise your intracranial pressure, your mean arterial pressure will have to rise too to maintain that cerebral perfusion pressure. Now your mean arterial pressure can rise, but can only rise to a certain point. So essentially there's a, a window that you're allowed to have for your intracranial pressure before it gets too high. And then your before mean your arterial, brain explodes. Basically, yeah. Before your mean, arterial, your mean arterial pressure can no longer rise beyond that to maintain your cerebral perfusion pressure. And then, as you say, Emma, your head explodes. What's more likely to happen is herniation, essentially, of certain parts of the brain. So different parts of the anatomy can, can herniate. So you can get uncle herniation, you can get tentoral herniation. Um, these are all just long, posh words. The thing you need to be aware of is coning, which is uh, essentially where there's so much pressure in the brain that the brain stem comes through the frame magnum. And clinically, we look out for a thing called Cushing's reflex, which Helen is... When your blood pressure rises and your heart rate drops. And you get irregular respirations as well, and that's essentially a pre-terminal sign as your cardiovascular centre, which is in the medulla, comes through the frame magnum. So keep an eye for that. So moving on to what we can actually do for these patients. Helen, medical management wise, what are our options? So you want to avoid features or anything that's going to make someone more ischemic. So you want to make sure you avoid hypoxia, avoid hypotension, mm. and just maintain that cerebral perfusion as well as you can. Through the assessment, you're keeping an eye on any um, raised intracranial pressure signs and symptoms. But you can always sit someone up or just tilt them a bit head up, which will help to reduce any intracranial pressure just from way of gravity, really. Simple, but it works. Rapid sequence induction and running a patient low on their CO2 levels. There's lots of different ways to do that, but that's more of a ventilatory support issue. And also um, mannitol or hypertonic saline, because it can help pull the water out of your intracranial space back into your um, vascular system mm. and helps to reduce intracranial pressure in that way. You mentioned something about sort of regular assessment as well. We, and we use the terms of sort of neuro-ops that we quite like in practice. What does that actually mean though? So neurological observation is when you do a formal GCS. You also assess pupil size and reaction and make sure that they're equal left and right. And you assess for any movement and whether the patients have got equal strengths bilaterally. And you're looking for facial drooping as well, just while you're talking to people. If you're really worried about a patient, if they've got a severe head injury, you do them 15 minutely. Your situation can change really rapidly. And that's normally the nursing staff. If it's someone that's not deteriorating or reasonably stable, then you would do half an hourly. Yeah. And then you reduce those as time goes on. Hourly, two hourly, four hourly, depending on the patient's clinical state. Emma, in terms of surgical options, so we talked about the medical side. What about interventions? If we want to get in there with some surgery, we need to call our resident, very important neurosurgeon, and they can come along with their tools. Um, so the first thing you might do... <laughs> <laughs> the neurosurgeon's going along with their... The tools. The tools. I just thought you were calling them tools. <laughs> <laughs> their minions are their tools. subtle thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to come along and they could drill a hole. Um, so they could do a bore hole to help to release that increased pressure. Or they could do a craniectomy, basically cut open the skull and take part of it off. Um, and then they could evacuate the hematoma, so get rid of that congealed, nasty blood. But in severe traumatic brain injuries, your target is to get them into neurosurgery within four hours from the incident. So no messing around, get them into neurosurgery. That's, what, that's always what they say. That's, that's the quote. But I think in practice, 
it's going to take a while. Neurosurgeon. Yeah, exactly. That. I mean, it, even if you're in a big sort of trauma centre and you've got neurosurgery on site, there's a lot of faffing around before that. It takes a while for them to get in from the incident. Exactly. They might be sitting in the ambulance yeah. for a good hour and then they're going to come into A&E and then they yeah. might have to be evacuated somewhere else. I, I wouldn't worry about that number, per se. I, wouldn't, I, I don't like tracing numbers, but I think yeah, certainly getting an early neurosurgical opinion is, is going to be key, isn't it? Get so, the men with the tools. So um, how about if someone's just a bit concussed? I mean, you know, if it's just a bit of concussion, you're not going to want to call the neurosurgeon, are you? Just a bit of concussion. Well, just a bit. if it's just a minor head injury, how are we going to treat that? Concussion is a really important thing, very common that we see after, after a multitude of head injuries, generally presenting with a sort of vague headache, poor um, concentration, a bit of nausea, but not really sort of a, a massive intracranial hemorrhage. Um, it's essentially due to what I describe it to patients as a bit, bit of bruising on the brain. That's kind of what it is. You've rattled your brain around a little bit and it, it's just a little bit fussy for a couple of days. The issue is it can last several weeks. It does impact quite a lot on, on work and school, particularly. Mm, especially if they've got memory issues. Exactly, yeah. Mm. So they can't retain stuff uh, as well. And, and them concentrating at work is often difficult. So so the key with, uh, with any head injury, certainly if it's a, a sporting-related injury, is to advise a graded return to, work, to activities. Avoid contact sports. Avoid. So in summary... Please use the guidelines, they are very important, they're there for a reason, and you can either read them at night when you're going to sleep, like Matthew does, or just read them as and when you need them. And remember to beware the elderly who have fallen. Think about other injuries they might have sustained, and think, have they collapsed, and what you know what might be the underlying cause of that collapse. Don't ever write off a drunk person as just being drunk. Always make sure you do your exposure examination part of your A2E assessment very well because you might miss some bleeding, bruising around the ears and the hairline, knuckles. Might give you some more clues as to what went on. And also remember, CPP equals MAP minus ICP. No neurosurgeons were intentionally offended in this podcast.